This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. Some of the world's biggest streaming companies, including Netflix and Spotify, were told today to contribute millions each year to support the production of Canadian content. The CRTC directed them to put 5% of their annual Canadian revenues in a fund. Now, that's expected to inject about $200 million in Canada's broadcasting system every year starting in September. But there are concerns the cost will be passed on to consumers. This past week, the CRTC released its much-anticipated Bill C-11 ruling on the initial mandated contributions from Internet streaming services. As you just heard, the takeaway headline was that the services will be required to contribute 5% of their Canadian revenues to support various Canadian funding programs that themselves support film and TV production, news, and music. But scratch below the surface, and it becomes clear that the actual contributions from internet streaming services are ignored, an updated definition of Canadian content still doesn't exist, commercial success is irrelevant, And it seems likely that it's consumers that are going to ultimately foot the bill. Len Saint-Aubin is the former Director General of Telecommunications Policy at Industry Canada and played a key role in the development of both the Broadcasting Act and Telecommunications Act. He provided consulting services to Netflix until 2020 and has since been an active participant in the debate on Internet and broadcast policy. He joins me on the podcast to talk about the CRTC ruling, the state of TV and film production in Canada, and what may lie ahead. Len, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me on, Michael. Yeah, no, I'm really glad that you've taken the time to come on. Now, Now, as you know, and as I suspect many of our listeners will know, earlier this week, the CRTC issued uh, certainly its most important decision to date on Bill C-11, the Internet Streaming Law. At issue in this decision was the creation of what they're describing as a base contribution by internet streamers, which effectively mandates payments by those streamers to support Canadian content policy priorities on what they really see the CRTC sees as an urgent basis. They're moving ahead on this before some other issues, and we'll talk a bit about this, I think, before some other issues are addressed. So we've got a lot to unpack here. I suspect Many people who listen to this podcast certainly are going to be familiar with Bill C-11, but it's gone off the radar screen a bit once it's moved into the CRTC regulatory world. I thought we could get started with a couple things. First, perhaps a brief intro into your background, into the area, since you've been uh, a part of Canadian broadcast regulation for so long. And second, uh, a quick explanation for where we find ourselves right now in that overall Bill C-11 implementation process. Okay. Well, uh, again, thanks, Michael, for having me on. Uh, Currently, I'm on the policy committee at the Canadian Internet Society. And uh, because of a series of columns that I wrote for the CART newsletter, I've been called an internet freedom fighter, and I'm okay with that. Um, I've been involved in broadcasting telecoms and internet policy for decades. I was part of the policy teams that developed the 1991 Broadcasting Act and the 1993 Telecoms Act. I represented Canada on the Governmental Advisory Committee to ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Sign Names and Numbers. And then after I retired from government as Director General Telecoms Policy, I was approached by the private sector, and that led to 10 years of providing policy and regulatory advice to Netflix until December 2020. And... uh, here I am uh, with you today. Uh, about this, the CRTC's latest decision, it's part of a, a long process, as you suggested. Um, let's say that it started around 2016. In 2018, there was the Broadcasting and Telecoms Legislative Review Panel. Then the government tabled legislation in Parliament. Finally, Bill C-11 stuck and passed. From the get-go, This whole policy discussion about internet streamers and Canadian content has really been focused on protecting the regulatory status quo from online competition. As I see it, this decision is just the next step in a long process of rearview mirror thinking. Certainly, the CRTC moving ahead in the way that they have as quickly as they have suggests that there's an urgency here. 
Um, indeed, they specifically say there's an urgency that the, the payments need to go out the door effectively even before all the, the policies are sorted out. Can you provide a bit of a an explanation for you know what the data itself actually tells us about the state of film and TV production in particular in Canada? Sure. Um, the latest data from the Canadian Media Producers Association show a very robust industry, and, and you've written about this. Um, production is at an all-time high. Now, bear with me for a few minutes here and, and your listeners because um, while we look at the numbers, because they really tell a very compelling story. Film and TV production in Canada has doubled in 10 years from 6 billion in 2013-14 to over 12 billion in 22-23. Now, most of that, most of that growth um, is in foreign location productions, but Canadian content production has benefited quite significantly too. Over the last 10 years, foreign investment in Canadian television content has also doubled to reach about 1 billion in 2022-2023 an increase of 12.4% over the previous year alone. So we're seeing uh, some significant uh, participation here. Most of that comes from foreign pre-sales and distribution advances, and most of that, of course, comes from global streamers. Now, about half of that amount, half of that $1 billion in foreign investment in Canadian TV goes to certified Canadian entertainment content, and the other half to non-certified CanCon. Frankly, I'm not really sure what non-certified CanCon is, but uh, and it's not really defined in the data. By the way, production of certified Canadian TV content has grown from 2.4 billion to 3.7 billion over the last 10 years. Again, very significant growth. And this next point is really important in this context. When you look at certified English language entertainment TV production. The data show that for the last five years, foreign investment has matched or exceeded financing from Canadian private and public broadcasters combined. You want me to repeat that? That I mean, I think it's probably worth repeating it just because yeah, you know, it runs last... so contra it runs so contrary to yeah. The kind of, the the sort of talk that you have about this emergency. And, and so some may some may wonder, did I actually hear what I think I just heard? So sure, go ahead. Yeah, you did. As I said, this is important. When you look at certified English language entertainment TV production, and it's different for French, of course, but in certified English language TV production, the data show that for the last five years, foreign investment has matched or exceeded financing from Canadian private and public broadcasters combined. It's a it's an incredible number. It's a credible success story. Yeah. A taken to together, be, to be, yeah. It's a huge it, success. It is, which which makes the the notion that what we desperately need is more regulatory intervention and more money, all the more puzzling in certain respects. Why don't why don't we talk a bit about that intervention and the more money? Because that's what uh the, this particular decision that the CRTC has issued all about. Can you talk a bit about what they are now mandating? that the streamers have to do from a payment perspective? Well, look, um, I want to say up front um, that I fully agree that it's completely reasonable to expect global streamers to participate in the production of local content in all of the markets that they serve. You know, unless they want to be just purveyors of U.S. content, which, you know, most of some of them are, some of them aren't. But... I also recognize that global streaming online has changed the dynamics of broadcasting and audiovisual markets. So reflexively applying yesterday's policy and regulation to global streamers is fraught with problems. That's what the Online Streaming Act and the CRTC's decision have done. They try to protect the regulatory status quo from online competition. So in this decision, the CRTC set, as you said, what they call a base contribution of 5% of revenues in Canada from streamers earning over $25 million to support Canadian content. They estimate that this will generate about $200 million. Based on the CRTC's own data, it looks like about $75 million of that will come from Netflix alone. 
And then they micromanaged how that 5% will be allocated, parceling it all out into allotments of 2% here, 1.5% and 0.5% there to a list of CanCon sub sorry, subsidy beneficiaries. Now, as you know, this 5% of gross revenue solution has a long history, at least back to 1995 and direct to home satellite broadcasting. But in this context, this level of micromanagement reinforces two aspects of rear view mirror thinking. And as you said, we'll come back to rear view mirror thinking because that's what this is about. First, that Canadian content is a regulatory burden that requires cross subsidy and contributions like a charity. We talk about contributions, not investment, not financing. And also the assumption that intrusive regulated spending obligations do a better job than market oriented investment at financing Canadian content production. Now, I don't think either one of those is true anymore, but the commission clearly believes that it is. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Let's, you know, you, you mentioned the micromanagement. I wanted to drill down a little bit on that because my sense is that the, the decision has resulted in a distinctly mixed reaction so far, uh, especially in terms of where the funding is going. You know, the government had promised, some may recall, a billion dollars, as you mentioned, the number estimated by the CRTC is 200 million. So some may just be underwhelmed that they'd been promised a much larger pot of gold at the end of the C11 rainbow. And the CRTC says it's just not happening. But it also turns out that the unallocated money to the Canada Media Fund could turn out to be relatively small, at least relative to the, the rest of the mandated payments and and the cmf tends to be the place that a lot in the industry focus on um and at the same time so we get some that are saying it's not as much as i thought we'd be getting same time we've got some streamers saying that the numbers are actually higher than what we might typically find in most other countries that have implemented this and the effect could be to change some market dynamics can, can you help make sense a little bit of this with with the decision that has left you know, it certainly doesn't come across as a win for all. We get many that that are seemingly a bit disappointed, either because they're underwhelmed or deeply concerned about what the implications might be. Well, you know, there's a an old saying in in regulation that if if the result is that everybody's unhappy, you probably got it right. But I don't think that's the case in this in this decision with this decision. I, I think yeah, there's likely a sense of lunch bag letdown for producers and creators who've become dependent on Canadian content subsidies. And those wild estimates of up to a billion dollars in new funding were never backed up. I mean, it was all just vaporware to begin with. Um, and folks in the industry know that foreign streamers are already investing more than 200 million in CanCon. And they're likely worried that with this decision, it'll just cause them to move money around. There's no new money here. As for the major streamers, frankly, I don't think that the 5% is the problem. They're already spending more than that here. I, I think that the real concern is elsewhere. I think first, the problem is that the CRTC has completely ignored the significant investments that they already make in Canada, not just in Canadian content, but also uh, their massive investments in foreign service productions that support and sustain one of the best production sectors in the world. And that infrastructure is essential to the creation of world-class Canadian content. And, you know, neither policy nor regulation seems to take that benefit in, in into account. And second, the micromanagement, as we've said, the, the micromanaged allocation runs completely counter to streamers' market-based, audience-driven approach to creating content that people want to watch. It's kind of like making them agents of government policy. And they would probably prefer a more transparent tax. And third, flowing from the last two concerns, they are concerned that this decision is an indication of what's to come um, with all those follow-up proceedings and decisions. And frankly, based on this decision, the outlook is not promising. Okay. I mean, that's, inter that's interesting to think about how they they may be thinking about it. Do you have any thoughts about how you think they may respond, at least in the, in the short term? This You said that, that the 5%... Uh, is something that might be manageable for some. I, I certainly, I know I've heard, especially on the audio side, we've been focused much more on the film and, and television side. On the audio side, since those margins are pretty thin and that the impact may be, may be more pronounced. And of course, not all video streamers have the same business model. Not everybody is Netflix. And 
the the impact may be somewhat different. But I'm curious how you how you think they may may respond. Certainly, there's been some focus on the prospect of passing along some of those costs to consumers. Others, as you you already seem to suggest, uh, that this may result in a bit of a reallocation in some of the existing spending. Can you talk a bit about how you see them ultimately responding to this if if the decision stays as is? Yeah, you're right. I uh, my comments have generally focused on the on the bigger streamers, and I think for them, as I said, the five percent isn't a big problem. It's really the micromanagement and the total reliance on regulation. Um, my guess is that they will probably make some noise, but my guess is they'll wait to see what comes next. Um, I think that Wendy Noss, president of the Motion Picture Association Canada, got it right when she said that the decision will make it harder for global streamers to collaborate directly with Canadian creatives and invest in world-class storytelling made in Canada for audiences here and around the world. Why is that the case? Because that relationship will now be mediated through people who manage all those subsidy funds. They will decide what content gets financed based on their own criteria and priorities, which may not focus on audiences and the market. And we've seen that with um, uh, subsidy funds in the past. So my guess is that big streamers will just take the 5% contribution out of what they're already spending and call it a cost of doing business. For prices, well, I think streamers have already, a lot of streamers have already increased prices. Some will, some won't. It's possible, as you say, that some smaller streamers will exit the market, and I'm I'm not going to try and speculate or make any predictions on who's going to come or go, who's going to stay or not. Um, but you know, there's an impact on Canadian broadcasters here that nobody's talking about. You know, we're talking about broadcasting regulation, but it's bizarre to me that in an age of content abundance, global distribution, and opportunities. Canadian policy and regulation are focused on requiring foreign actors to assume an even bigger role in financing Canadian entertainment content without creating any incentives for Canadian broadcasters to shift some of their own spending on foreign entertainment content into high-quality, competitive Canadian content. You know, it's an issue that hasn't been part of this discussion at all, but French language Canadian broadcasters actually spend more on original Canadian entertainment content than do English language private sector broadcasters, even though French language broadcasters have a smaller market and smaller revenue base. Canadian broadcasters on the English side seem to be stuck in this model of being middlemen offering American content to Canadians. And they spend actually more. I mean, certainly when it comes to Canadian content, totally, they spend more than than any foreign streamer. But when it comes to entertainment content, drama and comedy, they spend more on foreign content than they do on Canadian content. Nobody's talking about that. And in the meantime, we're, you know, moving ahead with getting more and more and more foreign spending, essentially outsourcing the financing of that culturally sensitive content and not creating any incentives, not looking into why it is that English language private sector broadcasters just don't see a business case here. Yeah, no, that I, it's a great point to raise, and that notion, which which I haven't heard discussed much, of essentially outsourcing uh, CanCon financing and some CanCon production to these foreign streamers is, I think, is an important issue. Uh, it does raise the question, given that we 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 operate in in a legal and trade environment where we've got uh, the USMCA or Kuzma, which requires non-discriminatory approaches. And to the extent to which we've got systems in place that require payments from these foreign players, but aren't able to access some of the funding, you know, what's, what are what your, some of your thoughts? Cause we've seen some saber rattling on, on this already. What are some of your thoughts on the, the possibility that as we move more and more to the kind of world that you're describing, that that opens up Canada to a potential trade challenge? Well, um, I think a lot depends on what's going to come next. I mean, a lot depends on how the commission, and not just the commission, um, but the government through CAVCO and, and the CMF, come to terms with the issue of what is Canadian content. Um, you know, right now, there are ways 
for foreign streamers to invest in Canadian content and get what they need in terms of world distribution rights outside Canada without actually owning the rights in the production, you know, acquiring distribution rights and advances and all of that. And we've seen that with productions such as Alias Grace and with an E and Travelers, where in that case, it was Netflix got rights outside Canada, the domestic broadcaster got rights inside Canada. And I mean, the whole thing moved along and it, it worked. Um, but, you know, in the longer term, I just don't think that it's sustainable to require foreign streamers to make significant investments in Canadian content, while at the same time preventing them from owning the rights in what they are forced to finance. Our other trading partners don't do that. Many of them have domestic content requirements that just don't uh, expect um, domestic ownership. It comes down to intellectual property. Content is intellectual property. Can you imagine a policy that required uh, pharmaceutical companies to invest in research in Canada and that prevented them from owning the rights in any intellectual property that comes out of that. Like I, I, IP is a big issue for the United States because it's a, a huge source of, of foreign revenues. Um, so I think that's going to be a problem. That, and squaring that um, uh, is is going to be a big part of this and and i think a big factor in where this goes in terms of legal issues and and all of the follow-up decisions you know i think the the more the commission continues with this intrusive uh regulation over market forces approach the greater the risk of challenge yeah no you're right uh, as we see that kind of escalation you know you you've talked about much of this depends on what comes next from a regulatory perspective let's talk a little bit about that um, first off the unfolding cancon debate part of bill c11 is a, a modernized or the vision of a modernized definition for what canadian content is the commission's quietly been engaged in some of that uh, there hasn't been as much on the public space but there have been lots of uh certainly meetings and workshops that have taken place amongst various groups as they talk about some of these things. How do you see that, that CanCon debate playing out? Um, well, I mean, it, in some ways it really is the sticking point here. I mean, it's the one point that is an obvious point of challenge from a trade perspective. Um, CAVCO and the CRTC and the CMF all apply criteria, which are mainly the same. Um, CAVCO and CMF require Canadian ownership. Uh, the CRTC has some flex in that respect. And certainly there's a lot of flex when it comes to um, international treaty co-productions. You know, there are models from other jurisdictions that have been raised in, in this debate in, in a lot of the media coverage. I'm, I'm hopeful that there will be some reasonable solution to this. So you're hoping for reasonableness on the hand-con debate. So, yeah. You know, from my perspective, I think part of that challenge is going to be you've got certainly vested interests that have benefited from the existing definition. You've got others that have not to date. And, you know, how that how that tension plays out, I think, will represent a significant challenge for the CRTC. I, another challenge, quite clearly, are some of the other contribution questions that they face. And this was at the heart of some of the debate around and controversy around Bill C-11. So that would include certainly discoverability and promotion, some of the existing spending that takes place. Because if you call something a base contribution, you're essentially suggesting that there may well be more to come. That might be in kind through things like discoverability, let's say, or perhaps commission sees this as just a down payment and has an expectation that if you don't meet certain other standards on some of those other issues, there's more payments to come. You have any thoughts on, on how some of those issues play out? Because I, I know certainly there are many stakeholders that have been very focused on what that's going to mean. Because that that moves us out of the basket of exclusively focusing on, you know, what is it going to cost you from a bottom line perspective to more operational related details in terms of how Canadians experience and use some of these services. None of this is really focused on Canadians as as taxpayers as citizens, as consumers. Um, it's really all focused on um, 
Canadian con financing Canadian content, content Canadian cons Canadian broadcasters and Canadian producers and foreign service providers. And I, in many ways, I don't see this decision as a very good indicator of CRTC independence. You know, they've they've required foreign companies that have absolutely nothing to do with news content to contribute to Canadian news. Um, and they've come out with this decision, uh, you know, well in advance of an election so that the government can claim, you know, before an election that, you know, they've made the foreign um, online streamers pay. Um, the commission's under a lot of pressure from cultural constituency, and um, they will certainly see this as a down payment. Um, but but the other factor here that, that makes it difficult to predict is that a lot of these decisions now have been punted into a post-election uh, time frame. So, uh, and that that may well that may well have an impact on things. One of the things that disturbs me about this decision is that um, it this has been the case with Canadian broadcasters for a long time, but when you start pulling foreign entities into this environment and making foreign private sector actors engaged almost like agents of the government in terms of doing things that, that the government should do. For example, like I don't have any problem at all with government policies to help finance com, you know, content for Indigenous, BIPOC, LGBTQ, and other minority communities. I think that's wonderful. But in my opinion, that should be financed by government. When you start pulling in private sector actors into doing that, when you co-opt them into uh, taking on roles that properly fall to government, there are consequences to that. It's one thing when you're dealing with that in a domestic marketplace and you're dealing with domestic players. When you, when you pull foreign actors into that environment, either it creates a disincentive to investment or it gives those private sector foreign actors inappropriate leverage in their dealings with government. And I don't think either of those outcomes is good. So I think, um, you know, when we look forward to all of these decisions uh, coming forward from the commission, um, this first decision uh, suggests a much greater reliance on regulation and intrusive, intrusive regulation than I would have expected in a much more competitive market with much greater um, choice for consumers. Um, and if that's an indication of what's to come, I think this issue of uh, drawing private sector foreign players into what has been a closed domestic policy and regulatory environment will become highly problematic. There's this notion that th this policy just represents free money in a sense. And I think you've, you've in some ways highlighted that nothing's really free. And in this case, there are some real costs and risks that come with what otherwise looks like, you know, this bundle of new money. And in fact, that it could end up becoming a case of be careful what you wish for. You just might get it uh, in terms of where some of these outcomes go. Len, you've been you've been so involved in these issues for so many years. It's taken too long, frankly, to have you on the podcast, but I'm really glad that you've taken the time to to come on now and, and talk about uh, Bill C11, the CRTC, and and what comes next. Thanks very much. That's the Law Bites podcast for this week. If you have comments, suggestions, or other feedback, write to Law Bites at pobox.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Law Bites Pod or Michael Geist at mgeist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The Law Bites podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening and see you next time.